So I'm standing here before you this morning, and a few weeks ago, my husband was able to speak to you. So I hope today my words will challenge you as much as his did, because he gave you all a wonderful message to encourage you to grow your faith. And I pray today that these words will also bless you. So I'm going to ask someone, if they don't mind, oh, we have them there. There they already are there. That was quick. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. You know, in our culture today, in the culture that we live in today, so many people are willing to accept Jesus as payment for their sins. But not as many people will accept Jesus as a way of life. They don't model their life as Jesus. Jesus has called us to be like him, to walk like he walked. And that is a challenge to us because when people ask us, are you born again? And we say, yes. But then they see you down the street and you might be saying, having an argument with a friend and they're like, if they're not born again, they're watching you. They're watching you every day. So we need to condition ourselves to be an example for others. Jesus taught us how to lead people to be like him, to grow in him. And today, as you can see, there's four chairs on the stage. I'm gonna use those chairs as an example today for our Christian life. So first, I'm gonna talk about chair one. We'll make this one chair one. We'll talk about this one first. Chair one is for people who are coming to church and seeking to know God. They're not born again, but maybe they were invited by a friend or some special occasion is happening at the church, so they come. So those are the people that are sitting in chair one. This chair is an example of this chair is how Jesus taught his disciples. I would like for you to turn to in your Bibles to John chapter one, Verse 37. I'm sorry, I may have given you the wrong one there. Let me look here. This, this chair, I'm going to call it the seeker chair. People who are seeking, looking for something. And we read in 1 John chapter 37, it says, when the, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following him. And he asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him and it was about the 10th hour. So they spent the whole day with Jesus. When we are seekers, when we are sitting in this chair, when we are new, 
believers do learning about what is this Christianity thing? What, why do people go to church? That's what this chair represents, is the people who are seeking to find a way. We just read in the Bible where it said Jesus told them, come and you will see. So people come here because they want to see. They come to you if you're a Christ follower. They want to see. They want to learn. That's how they believe is by your example. When we first talk to people about Christ, we always share a testimony. Just like Timothy did the day when he was up here, he gave us the message, and then he shared with you his testimony. Because that's powerful. How did God change your life? Share things that God does for you in life. Most of you won't believe this, but tomorrow, yesterday I couldn't walk. Could I walk yesterday, Tim? I got up from my bed, I have a knee problem, and I could not walk. And I'm like, Timothy, what am I going to do? I'm preaching tomorrow, I can't walk. And I get up this morning, and I completely forgot about it because it's not there. <laughs> I didn't even think about it because I was sitting here this morning. I'm like, yesterday I couldn't walk. And even the day before I was having some problems, I get up this morning and it's gone. God does that. God loves us enough that he just does amazing things. So when we give our testimony to other people, they're going to have questions for you. So you need to be prepared to answer those questions. And the only way you can be prepared to answer the questions they have for you is if you study God's word. If you study God's word, you plant his word in your heart. Then when people come to you and they ask you questions, you are prepared to answer and answer correctly leading them to an understanding that they need a savior. Some people don't even realize they need a savior. But everyone does. We're all lost, and every one of us need a savior. And it's our job to reach the lost. It's our job to do that. Jesus instructed us in the Great Commission, but first, before we can just go to someone, I want to tell you about Jesus. You need to be born again. Get on your knees and pray this prayer. That's not going to change someone's life. You need to build a relationship with the person first. Get to know people. Talk with them. Share with them your experience. Become their friend. Reach out to them. Build a relationship. Just like Jesus said in the passage, they were asking him questions. He said, come, come and see. And they came and sat with him and listened through the day. So the first thing before we start leading others to this chair, which is the chair of people coming to church, before we can do that, we have to first build a relationship with them. Otherwise, they will have no reason to want to be with us. So build relationships with people. Become friends with people. Help them to trust you. Help them to love you. Help them to care about you. And the only way they will is if you first do that for them. If you care about them and you love them, you will gain their trust. Now I'm going to bring up chair two, and we're going to talk about this chair. Chair two is the person, they've left chair one, and now they have become born again. They're excited. They're new Christians. They're born again. And they will be start learning how Jesus is teaching them by 
your example, by the church's example. They will start coming to church. They will start being discipled. They will start learning about the word of God. They will learn mostly by watching you. People learn the most by watching people. So it's, it's so important how we conduct our lives. If we say, I'm a Christian, then they're going to watch you. Okay, let's see what this Christian does. It's easier for us today to learn a lot about God because we have the Bible. Before, they had to learn from person to person to person. And today, we have the word of God. So we have no reason not to know because we have the map and we're able to read it every day. We're able to learn, we're able to study it. It's so important that we have some scriptures buried in our hearts so we're ready to answer when someone asks. The church's job is to encourage new believers. New believers will come to church. They may be very discouraged because they're new believers. They don't understand many things of, of Christianity and they're learning. And then they become a believer. And the church is going to teach. And we are going to teach as brothers and sisters in Christ. What do we teach? Well, the person in this chair, the new believer, is like a newborn baby. What do we teach newborn babies? We teach them how to walk. We have to teach a baby how to walk. How do we teach a new believer? We have to teach them how to walk. We have to teach them how to walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a different walk than what they had before. That's one of the things we teach. What else do you teach a newborn baby? You teach them to talk. Babies, when they're little, they're mama, mama, they'll, they'll mumble and mumble, and you're like, ay, ay, ay. But as they learn, and as they grow, they speak clearly. As we are Christians, that is us. We begin to speak more clearly. And we are learning to tell God's story. We can tell God's story to other people. What else do we do to newborn babies? We have to clean them. They don't clean themselves. Newborn babies need to help to know how to be cleansed. They come to church to learn, how do I not keep repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again? How do I get cleansed from that? They need to learn that when you pray the prayer of forgiveness, and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. The old things of the past are gone. You're clean. You're cleansed. Now you start learning how to walk the Christian life. What else does a baby have to learn? They have to learn their identity. Who are they? Where do they come from? We teach newborn babies where they came from within our family. A new believer learns about the family of God. Newborn babies learn about the family they're born into. New believers learn about the family of God. And I pray that family is kind, loving, generous, faithful. And so the new believer sees those things and they follow. 
The Bible teaches us how to follow Christ. It's not something we have to just say, well, how do I do that? We know how to do it. God's word tells us how to do it. But the words of this Bible do not jump into your mind unless you read them. So it's important that you take time to read God's word. You know, Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So now let's talk about chair three. The chairs are gonna get hidden. Chair three. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verses four through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as a son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirit and life? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness no Discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, peace for those who have been trained by it. So now we've gone from seeking to believing and now we are learning the fruit. What is the fruit? As we grow in Christ, as we learn in Christ, there will be struggles that will come our way. Things will happen in our life that are tough, that are hard. I, if I stood here and told you all the things that have come to me that are tough and struggled since I was born again, we would be sitting here for weeks. So I won't do that. But they come. Struggles will come. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that all struggles that come are not disciplined. Some are. I would, ex when struggles come, you need to examine your life. Lord, am I doing something that's out of your will? Do I need to cleanse myself from that? Some struggles come because that's just life. Life happens. And through life, struggles will come. No one can live a life a perfect that nothing happens to you. If you find that person, bring them to me, because I would like to meet them. I can't, I've never met a person that hasn't gone through struggles. But you know, through those struggles, you grow. You grow. I don't know why it is, but when we struggle, we go to the Word. When we're struggling, we get on our knees. When we're struggling, we seek God more. 
And when life is going great and everything is good, sometimes we tend to say, well, I don't really have time today. I don't really have time. I'm, I've got a lot of things to do today, and I really, I'll read my Bible tomorrow. And then the struggles come. And then struggles come. And there we are on our knees in the Word, right where God wants us to be. And then we ask ourselves, why do struggles come? Well, maybe that's why. God is pulling us to Him. As we grow in Christ, we become more doers. We start doing. We begin to understand struggles that Christ went through. We understand them more when you become born again. You start going to church. You're attending the services. You start learning to feed yourself in the word. You start learning to resist sin and not live it every day. You work hard to resist it. And then you start trying to help others. Even the people who have hurt you. Church, even the people who have hurt you. Reach out to them. That is the truth. Why does, why does Jesus say the workers are few? Look at all of us. There's many of us here. Why does he say? And the reason why is because so many people, when it gets hard to serve the Lord, when struggles come and it gets hard to do the Christian life, many people just quit. They just quit. They don't deny the Lord. They don't say, I'm not a Christian anymore. They just stop doing the other things. They just quit going to church. Oh, I still love Jesus. But, you know, I'm kind of busy to go to church. Why does Jesus say the workers are few? You may lose something in your life. You may lose a friend. You may lose a job. You may lose a business. You may lose a ministry. But don't give up. Don't let those struggles in life make you give up. After a time of struggling, so many people have struggled and they're sitting here and they're struggling and they're saying, that's it, I'm going back to chair two. <laughs> chair two was easy. <laughs> I could just come to church. I could just be with my friends. It was easier in chair two. Chair three is tough. When you move to chair three, it becomes tough. Chair three is a spirit-filled life. It's a life that people can see Christ in you. It's a life of denying yourself. Denying yourself. Learning more and more to say no to me and yes to someone else. Yes to God. No to me. Yes to God. No self pats on the back. Do you know what that is? I'm going to give you an example of what a self pat on the back is. You know, in Timothy and I in America, we'll go places and people will find out that we're missionaries that come to Kenya. And they'll say, oh, wow. Wow. That is so 
wonderful. And Timothy and I look at him and say, no, <laughs> don't say that. Because it was up to us. We would stay home. We would not go. <laughs> it's only God. When God tells you to do something, you better do it. Because if it was up to Timothy and I, we would not come. That's God. That's God. And God will do the same to you. He may not tell you to go to a foreign land, but he may tell you to go to your neighbor. He may tell you to go to the teacher at the school or the principal or the business owner or the store worker or the friend you're walking by in the street. God calls us all to different things. If he called us all to the same things, we'd all be going to Africa <laughs> and sitting right here talking about God. But God doesn't do that. He calls you to someone. He calls you to someone else. He calls you to someone else. He called Timothy and I to Africa. And that's why we're here. Not because of us, because of God. So you cannot live in chair three. That's where we are now. We're living in chair three. You can't live in chair three in your flesh, in yourself, thinking about yourself, thinking about, oh, what's my problem? Oh, what do I need? You can't be in chair three and think that way. In chair three, you're thinking about other people. You're concerned about other people. You have a servant's heart, a heart to serve. Serve is doing. Serving is meeting other people's needs, not your own. Not focusing on yourself, but focusing on other people. Chair number three represents the people in the church who are willing to work. They're not, they don't just come on Sunday and sit. They come on Sunday and work. They come throughout the week. It might even be someone who comes and cleans this floor I'm standing on. They're serving God in a powerful way. It may be the person who mops the floor, who washes the windows, or cleans the cho. They are no more powerful than anyone else. We're all serving God, and God has called us all to different things. Now, I'm going to move to chair four. I'll put it on this side so you can see chair four. This chair is the people who have moved from the chair one, which is seeking, chair two, believing, chair three, serving, doing, now chair four is going out. Chair four is a person who has moved from the three chairs and now they've moved to chair four. They're ready to go out and do what God has called them to do. Do you know what God has called you to do? Do you know? He will tell you. He will tell you if you ask. God is not a God that will force himself on you and force you to do things. You ask him, God, 
what are you calling me to do? And he will make it known to you. He will show you what he wants you to do. Let's turn to John 15, verse 1. John 15, verse 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. So let's call this the chair of bearing much fruit. This is the chair of bearing much fruit. You have passed from seeking to believing to serving, and now you're going out. What has God called you to do? I told you, God called Timothy and I to go to Africa. That's what we do. What has God called you to do? And no one can tell me God has not called you to something because I know God has. He's called every one of you to something. If you don't know what it is, you need to go home and get on your knees and ask because it's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Even though you have struggles, Even though there's times where it's hard, it's a wonderful life. You will never trade it to go back. If we think about these examples of four chairs, it seems that, let's see, about maybe 20 or 30 percent of the people here today began a journey and moved to chair three. How many have moved to chair three? How many are serving? How many are doing? How many? It seems like it's a small amount of people that moved to chair three. Then they begin the journey. They've moved to chair three. Now we know why Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We are the harvest. You are the harvest. Are you a worker? Do you serve? Do you do? You need to. You need to. Because Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. There are many people to harvest. Many. Look out on the road. Look in this town. When I go in town in the day, the people are so many. You're moving like this. There's so many people you can hardly move. Because there's so many. That's the harvest. That's the harvest. But the workers are few. And I'm talking to myself too. I don't leave my office and go out on the street and say, how are you today? Can I talk to you for a minute? I don't do that. I need to. We need to. We need to do that. We need to reach out. Because the end is close. 
Jesus could return today. And how many people would be lost? How many? How many people you love would be lost? It's important. It's important, church. It's important. Many people stay in chair too because it's more comfortable. It's a more comfortable place to sit. But as Christ followers, we need to move. We need to move to chair three, and then we need to move to chair four. Chair one, become a Christian. Chair two, be baptized, identify with Christ, become a new believer. Chair three, Teach others, serve, learn to be obedient. Hmm, that's a tough word, obedient. You know, I read in the Bible where wives have to be obedient to their husbands. Sometimes that's tough, because we think we know better. But God instructs us in ways that are best for our lives. He wouldn't tell us to do that if it wasn't good for us, if it wasn't something that would make us healthier, something that would make us a better person. This is why he gives us those instructions for our good. Let's learn ourselves to move Remember when you were first born again, when you first were seeking, seeking to know God, becoming born again and baptized. Don't get stuck here. Don't stay in church here. Don't get born again and baptized and just come to church and say, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Say, I want to do something more. I want to serve. I want to do I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'm sure if you went to the pastor, the leaders of this church, they have a long list of things that need to be done. And I'm sure they could help you with something. Let's all move from chair three, serving and doing, and then realize what God has called us to do from there for us, that's chair four. So Timothy and I actually are living in chair four because we came to Africa. We're living in chair four. And it's not always easy. I'm not telling you it'll just be this easy life, but it'll be a wonderful life. It'll be a wonderful life because God has so much love for you and he desires the absolute best for you. So even though Timothy and I come to Africa, God's going to call you to go to your neighbor. He's going to call you to go somewhere else. He's going to call all of us to something. I promise you, every person in this room has been called to something. Live what he's called you to do. It's in a wonderful life, and struggles happen. Do you know when Timothy and I have been here this time, our house was robbed? Wow. Go to Africa, serve the Lord, and someone will rob your house and steal your things. That's tough. I believe that's called a struggle. But Timothy and I didn't say, well, that's it, we're finished. We're going home. This God thing doesn't work. We're not doing it. We don't do that. God is your source. He is your provider. He's the love of your life. When your house gets robbed, where do you go? You go to the foot of the cross. You go to the foot of the cross, and you say, dear God, what kind of person would do that? Help them. Help them to know the way because they don't know. And if you return today, they would be lost forever because they don't know. 
tak ciepło, tak ciepło. All of us need to come here. All of us need to get to Jeopardy. It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. That should be our motive. That should be our passion. That should be the desire of our life. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that this church be a beacon of hope and discipleship, I pray that the people will want to move from chair one and chair two and become deeply rooted in you. Help people to see what they can do for others more than what they can do for themselves. Help us all to be good servants, disciples, Father, we praise you for who you are. You are an awesome God. You never give up on us, even though we fail. And there's times that we just don't make the mark. But you still love us. You still desire to have a relationship with us. What an awesome God you are. We thank you. And we praise you that you don't give up on us, that you are always reaching out for us, that you're always loving us. And even when we go through struggles, you are there. You are reaching out to us. You are holding us. You are cradling us in the palm of your hand. And we thank you for that, Father. We praise you for that. We give you all the glory for that. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Mungu aku barik izana.